Hi, I'm Richard Morai, Senior Minister at Unity of Phoenix Spiritual Center, and I want to thank you for visiting our website and for tuning in to today's message. If you feel inspired by today's talk, I really encourage you to make a donation by hitting that button below and making a contribution to this ministry. It'll allow us to continue these messages online and to do the great work we do here at Unity of Phoenix, which is to inspire people to live better lives. So thanks for tuning in, thanks for your support, and we hope to see you at a Sunday real soon. So I got a question for you, you ready? Have you ever missed a moment? <laughs> you know what I mean by that? Where you thought you were talking about one thing and it turns out you were really talking about something else? And you're like, oh, well if you told me that's what we were talking about. Like the time maybe when your, your kid brought the report card home, right? And you thought they were talking, you thought you were talking about his grades. And all he really wanted to know was that you loved him. Right? Have you ever had that one? Or your spouse comes out in an outfit. <laughs> and you really think you're talking about the outfit, right? <laughs> and what they want to know is that you think they're just as beautiful as ever. True? Right? Or a friend calls you with a problem, right? And, and you just love that friend so much, you want to fix the problem. And what they want to know is that you just care, right? So there's these moments that really are like spiritual traps, <laughs> right? And how do you sign that? Trap? That's how it feels anyway, huh? Right? So they're like spiritual traps because your ego wants to solve the problem or it wants to be in the moment from an intellectual, smart, get it right kind of way, right? And then it's only afterwards that you realize, oh, that wasn't really an ego problem. That was a love issue. And I did not offer the love that that person wanted in that moment because I was trying to be helpful. And have you ever tried to be too helpful? And so there's these moments, these moments that we either rise up into or we kind of get left behind. How many of you have ever had to learn a problem or experience a problem more than once before you got the, <laughs> before you got the learning? Now, how many of you know what a mulligan is in golf, right? A mulligan is, is where you get an opportunity, not that it's legal, to drop another ball because your shot wasn't as perfect as you knew was within you, right? Because you knew you had a better shot within you. So if you're playing with friends, they just kind of look the other way. You drop another ball and you get another shot at it. Now, there's people that say, well, mulligans aren't legal because that's not the way life works. Life doesn't give you second chances. And I disagree. Like life gives you as many second chances as you need until you learn the lesson that you came to learn. How many of you have ever, <laughs> how many of you have ever dated the same person in a different face more than once? <laughs> right? And you get another opportunity, right? It's like the universe saying, do you want it or do you not want it? And you think, well, I think I want it. And then, you, then it's like, no, I didn't want it, right? <laughs> and it's this wonderful opportunity, that, these moments that keep coming back around and around and around again. Because people think that life is a straight line. But it's not. Life is a spiral. And it's ever aspiring upward. And every time we come back around that point, we get an opportunity to learn that lesson again from a new point of view. And if we don't learn that lesson, if we don't grab the moment, if we don't really become the person that it's within us to become, don't worry. In a month, in a year, in a few years, it'll circle back around. And you'll get another opportunity to be that amazing child of God that God knows that you are. And it's like, well, I really want to get it the first time. Great. Then love more. Right? Love more. So I wanted to do a series this summer, 
Because I get these few weeks with you every summer. And, I, and every time, every summer, I really want it to be the best use of this time, to really teach the thing that my soul is calling to teach the most and to be with you on Sunday morning. So I get this opportunity. So last, last year I did the five prayers that will change your life. And the last sabbatical that Richard went on, I did the, the seven steps to a, to a miracle. And this year what I want to talk about is, is called uh, Summer of Love. Because I always love that name. In, in the 60s, there was a summer they called the Summer of Love. And I don't want to go back to Hate ashbury and I don't want to do the free love thing. That, that, but, but I do love the idea of this idea of a Summer of Love. And so as I was doing this research on the Summer of Love, I thought the Summer of Love was 1968. So I, I was waiting to get to the Summer of Love, to back to 1968, because then it would have been a, the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love. Well, it turns out the Summer of Love was 1967. I missed it. I completely missed it. But I so liked the summer of love that I wasn't giving up on it. I was, I was going to use it again. I was just going to use it a year late. And so I've dedicated this summer to the summer of love. And because I believe that this summer we need a summer of love. Will you give me an amen? amen. We need a summer of love. And, and I know that, that in many of our lives it, it's sometimes getting more and more difficult to be the loving person we want to be. Does everybody have at least one person in your life where it's really difficult for you to be the most loving version of yourself? And if you don't, I'll invite you to any of my family reunions and you can just, <laughs> I got uncles, man, I got uncles, right? But the more that I looked at 1968, I realized that 1968 really should have been called the summer of love. As, as you look at 1968, it was one of the most turbulent years of the 20th century. It was a time of great unrest in our nation. And we think we have conflict and unrest in our nation now. 1968, 50 years ago, it was off the charts. This is from Wikipedia. The year began with the Tet Offensive in the, in the midst of the Vietnam War, which reached a climax after President Lyndon B. Johnson signed legislation allowing an increase of the maximum number of troops on the ground at one time. And he raised it to 550,000 people at Vietnam at one time. Likewise, it was also the most expensive year of the war, costing $77.4 billion dollars. While the anti-war movement at home was growing in leaps and bounds, and also the occurrence of the May Lai Massacre, the, the feelings of unrest toward the war only increased in 1968. In April of 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and the, country, and the country erupted into a violent riots. Most severe were in Washington, D.C., Chicago, and Baltimore, and over 45 people were killed in that month of protest which led to the greater racial tension between blacks and whites in America. And because of this, there was a landmark piece of legislation called the Civil Rights Act of 1968 that was passed in, also in April, effectively prohibited housing discrimination based on race. And then in June, there was the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. And there threw kind of the country into this uncertainty of the race for the Democratic Party. And after, and after Hubert Humphrey was declared the nominee in 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago, which only started another level of protests, riots and protests in Chicago about the anti-war movement with the police. The chaos within the Democratic Party helped uh, uh, elect Richard Nixon as the Republican former vice president to the presidency in November. A partially strong showing by a segregationist George Wallace of the American Independent Party in 1968 uh, created, uh, showed the signs of the deep racial tensions in our country, especially in the South. Culturally, in the, the number one movie was 2001 Space Odyssey. The, the movie that won the, best, the Academy Award was Oliver. Sir, can I have more? No, that was, uh, sorry. And the, mo and the most popular record of 1968 was Hey Jude. And then in December of 1968, we sent Apollo 8 out into space. And it was the first time we had a manned aircraft outside the orbit of the planet. Actually went into the, the orbit of the moon. And for the first time in our history, we saw the dark side of the moon. And it was the first time in our history as a people that we saw the planet from space. 
where we could see the complete planet. And so there was incredible tension, incredible problems in 1968. But there was also some moments, some incredible moments. And what I want us to look at today is how are we being called in those moments to rise up, to, to become more loving, to be the people that we were created to be. Because if we don't learn our lessons, the opportunity is that we're going to get an opportunity to repeat them. And repeat them again and again and again until we rise up and really become the full potential of who we can be. So I went back. I said, well, if this happened 50 years ago, what happened 50 years before that? Do you know what happened, what was going on 50 years before that? The, the First World War. That our, that our nation, the world was at war in, in 1918. And then I said, well, what happened before that? I went back another 50 years. And 50 years before that, there was the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. Three days after his action to dismiss the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, the United States House of Representatives voted 26 to 47 in favor of a resolute to impeach Andrew Johnson. When it was taken up in the full Senate, Johnson was acquitted in the U.S. Senate by one vote. He would have been impeached, but one vote. But not only that happened in the summer of 1968, in July, of ni in eight, I'm sorry, in July of 1868, the 14th Amendment was adopted, guaranteeing that all citizenship to former freed slaves. So what I want you to see is this year, this moment, is an incredibly powerful moment that's come lo looping back around over and over and over again to ask us as a people, how are we going to stand with it? What are we going to do with this? Are we going to really rise up in the moment and be the most loving version of ourselves, or are we going to just let it pass in the chaos and the confusion that we know? How many of you are challenged by what's going on in our country right now? How many of you have friends or family members that your, your relationship is being impacted because they don't believe the way you believe about what's going on right now? How many of you want to tell them how wrong they are? <laughs> and that they should watch your news channel, right? <laughs> right? And what I want you to see today is that we've been here before. This is a moment that we've known before in this country. And we can go around and wait another 50 years and another 50 years and another 50 years. Or we can decide to heal it really heal it in such a way that we rise up to a new day, a new possibility, where we are not separate, where we stand together and build bridges, even in disagreement. You know, Jesus was a moment. His ministry only lasted three years. And I'm sure for the people that followed him and walked with him and listened to him, it, it only felt like a moment, that that three years was over before they knew it. And he was speaking to people that were, by and large, oppressed people. The Israelites were oppressed by Roman rule. They were not a free people. And he spoke to them in such a way he challenged them to love in a bigger way than was easy, was customary, that they wanted to. He said that we were to love God with all our might, with all our strength, with all our heart, with all our soul. But then he went further and said that we're also to love our neighbor as ourself. Now, how many of you have neighbors that are really easy to love? Right, that cut their bushes the way you want them to cut their bushes and, <laughs> and really park where they're supposed to park and, you know, help out when you need a hand. And they're just easy to love. And how many of you have neighbors that are kind of difficult to love, that their tree falls into your yard and... And, you know, their dog or their cat does this or that, and they're kind of just a pain, right? Does everybody have a, a difficult neighbor? Come to, you know, we got great neighbors, but, you know, it, it happens, right? And, and the opportunity is, what are you going to do with it? 
right? Because it would be great if we could fix them. How are you doing with that? <laughs> like most of us don't have that as a superpower. That would be my pick. But the superpower that we all have is the ability to love. Let me, let me say it the way Jesus did. Luke 6, 27 through 36. But I say to you, listen, love your enemies and do good for those who hate you. What? Bless those who curse you and pray for those who abuse you. And if anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer him the other. And if anyone takes your coat, offer him your shirt. Give to anyone who begs you. And if anyone asks for their goods, ask. And I'm sorry. But if anyone begs you, and if anyone asks, takes away your goods, do not ask for them. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And if you love those who love you, what credit is that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good unto you, what credit is that? Even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those who you receive from, what credit is that? Even sinners lend to sinners. But love your enemies and do good and lend and expect nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be called children of the Most High. For, it is kind and, for he is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Be merciful just as your heavenly Father is merciful. That's tough. Right? It is. It's tough. Because there's a sense in our world that life should be fair. How many of you were taught that life's fair? How many of you taught that life should be fair? Right? So if I, give on, if I give something to you, if it's fair, you'll give something back to me. True? And preferably with more value than I gave you. <laughs> right? Because that, that's called super fair. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And so we love the people that are super fair with us. Right? They, they help us. They bless us. They love us. They compliment us. They think we're smart and good looking and fabulous on the dance floor. Right? <laughs> they affirm us over and over and over again, and we love them. But then there's all these other people. Right? All these other people who don't act right. <laughs> and we know, right? Because we love to judge the heck out of them. Because they're so easy to judge. And they're so wrong. How many of you have people that you just love thinking, oh, they are so wrong? Right? I mean, we love thinking they're so wrong. And, and in the midst of all of this, Jesus said that we're called to love the people that are hard to love. And it's like, I don't want to. Got it. I just don't want to. I just want to love the easy ones. God, and you can take care of the rest. Right? And it's that thinking that it causes us to go around one more time. And around one more time, and around one more time, and around one more time. Because the reality is, the infinite love of God is in you, but it's got to come through you. See, I really don't believe that we love. I really believe that what happens is we just open our hearts, and the infinite love of God comes through us. And we, we personalize and we think we do it when we say, I love you. And, and we really believe that we do, we, that we really love the people we love, that somehow it's just coming from us. But I really believe that from a spiritual dimension, it really is just about you opening your heart in that moment to allowing the infinite love of God just to flow through you. And in the world right now, our hearts are either open or they're closed. And I'd like to suggest that I think our hearts are much more closed than we like to believe. That we consider ourselves loving people, but if your heart's not opening, open, love isn't happening. And that love only can happen in a moment. You can't add it up. You can't store it away. You can't put it in the bank and say, well, I don't want to be loving this month or this week or this moment or with this person. I, but I, wanted to have, I want to withdraw from my love bank account, so just take a withdrawal. Here's my deposit slip. Here's my check. Good luck. 
that love only happens in a moment. That your heart's either open in that moment to love so that love flows or doesn't. So what if, as we begin this seven weeks of summer of love, I want you to pay attention to how often your heart is actually open. Because it doesn't count if it's not. It doesn't help if it's not. So you ready for your homework? Okay, your homework's twofold. I'm going to go to the handheld. I don't know where Jeremy is, but I'm going on the handheld. So there's two things I want. First thing, have you noticed that maybe you add more conflict than needs to be in, in a situation? Are you ever known to say snarky things on Facebook? Right? Have you ever said snarky? You know what snarky is? It's a, it's a spiritual term in the Old Testament. <laughs> Moses said, thou shalt not be snarky, right? <laughs> right? It's a, it's a spiritual term, right? So here's the first, your first homework. For the next seven days, and for, hopefully for the whole seven weeks, but for the next seven days, you're not going to add any conflict to the world. The world has enough right now. So we're not going to add conflict. We're not going to share our opinion that is confrontational to other people unless it's really generated by love. But we're not going to add conflict to the world for the next seven days. Can I get a pinky swear? <laughs> I pinky swear not to add conflict to the world this week. Together? I pinky swear not to add conflict to the world this week. One week, I pinky swear. Right? That, that's, that's an official spiritual thing that you just did, right? <laughs> that for the next week, no matter how much you want to judge somebody else, pinky swear. Right? No matter how much somebody in your world is wrong, you made a pinky swear. No matter how right you want to be, pinky swear. Because you cannot be in judgment and be in love in the same moment, right? And the second homework, I want you to practice opening your heart. Will you do that with me right now? I want you to put your hands on your, your hand on your chest, or both hands on your chest, and I want you to feel what it feels like when your heart is open. So I want you to think about someone that you love. It can be a family member, it can be a puppy, a kitten, somebody you love. And I want you to feel what happens when you think, when you see in your mind's eye, someone you love, how much your heart opens. And now I want you to think of a moment of conflict, maybe a moment of anger, and feel how quickly your heart closes. And now think of someone you love again. Feel, feel what it feels like when your heart is wide open. Feel how much love can flow through you. Could you feel that? Could everybody feel that? And what I, want you to see, what I want you to see is that was not physical, right? Nothing really happened in your chest physically. It was totally spiritual. That when your heart opens, you can literally feel the energy shift in your chest when your heart opens. And what I want you to pay attention this week as part of your homework is I want you to pay attention how many times your heart is open and how many times it's closed. Because you can't be in judgment with an open heart. You can't be anxious or afraid and have an open heart. You just won't do it. Because the first thing that happens when you get anxious or afraid is that you close your heart to protect yourself. And in that moment, love's no longer flowing. We're not adding to the love on the planet. We're actually just holding still. And, and I know that we want this love to come from somewhere else, but where does the love of God come from? Our hearts. We got seven billion of us on this planet. The moment everybody opens their hearts, at that moment, the world is different. Now, when you're in the presence of someone who just loves you, can you feel that? Does that call forth your best self? Right? When you're in the presence of somebody who just loves you, it calls forth the best that's within you. For seven days, you have two homework assignments. First one, is to the best of your ability, you're not gonna add any more conflict to our world. 
okay, for the next seven days. That means you're not going to be snarky, you're not going to get an attitude, you're not going to add conflict to the planet for seven days. And for seven days, you make a commitment that as often as possible, you're going to open your heart and just see what happens in your life when you add more love. Because there's this core belief in our world today that love isn't enough, that we have to solve the problems and then love will be okay, or then love will be enough. But what if love is the way we solve the problems? What if love is the way that we heal the planet? For the next seven days, what's your first one? Don't add conflict. Let's say it together. Don't add conflict. One more time. Don't add conflict, all right? Now, there's going to be a moment where you're going to want to. And I want you to remember this commitment in your pinky swear. Don't add conflict. The other thing, and this is sometimes tougher, is you're going to open your heart. You're going to open your heart when you don't want to open your heart. You're going to open your heart to people you don't want to open your heart to. You're going to add love. And you're going to see if over and over you going to your heart changes situations for the better. So that we actually believe that love is the most powerful thing in the universe. I believe in love. Will you say that with me? I believe in love. One more time. I believe in love. Let's pray. I invite you to open your mind, your heart, your soul to the activity of love. And I want you to open your heart all the way right now. I want you to just fill this room with all the love that you are. That in this room where you are safe, where you are loved, where you are valued, where, where we behold you as, as a radiant child of God, I want you to feel what it feels like to open your heart all the way, that you can actually do it, that you're safe, that your, your heart has this incredible elasticity that it is so big, that it can download so much of God's love. And that every time your brain wants to get into the drama, every time your ego wants to get involved in a situation, every time you want somebody to know how right you are, we suspend conflict. And we go to our heart, and we open our heart all the way. And so it is. Amen.